All right, uh, Dan, you want to come up? Uh, Dan Kastner is the uh, scientific director for the uh, Division of Intramural Research at NHGRI, and he's with us today to give you a presentation about the division. Council has no direct oversight or responsibility to the intramural research program, but we think it's very appropriate that you get a full range and understanding of all of the kind of science that goes on under the NHGRI. Uh, and so Dan's going to fill, uh, fill you in about the intramural program. And, and we do this just, for, again, for new council, we do this every couple to few years. We have a presentation by the scientific director to, to sort of let you know what's happening on the other part of the institute, um, which, as and I'm sure Dan will describe, um, has its own external advisory group, the Board of Scientific Counselors. So again, this is as much as anything just for your uh, uh, orientation to other things going on with institute funds. Dan. All right. Well, thank you very much, Eric and Rudy, and thank you all for the opportunity to talk to you uh, this morning. I realize that I have uh, just half an hour, so I won't uh, 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 perseverate here. Uh, but in any case, uh, really the intramural program is something that is uh, near and dear to uh, my heart. And over the course of the next uh, little bit, uh, we will talk about seven different things. Uh, first of all, I'll give you a little bit of background with regard to intramural research uh, at the NIH in general, just in terms of uh, how it uh, um, operates. Uh, secondly, I'll give you a big picture view of the NHGRI intramural research program. Thirdly, I'll give you uh, a sampler of some recent scientific accomplishments beyond what Eric uh, mentioned just a couple minutes ago. Fourthly, I'll talk a little bit about the NHGRI intramural research program as a genomic catalyst, as uh, basically uh, a organization that was developed actually, at least in part, uh, with the idea of Francis uh, Collins back in 1993, that really uh, the intramural program of NHGRI should be the engine uh, that would drive uh, the infusion of genomic thinking and technology into the broader uh, intramural program of the NIH. Uh, fifthly, we'll talk a little bit about scientific review of the NHGRI intramural research program. Sixth, I'll give you a little bit of an update uh, with regard to our budget. And then finally, uh, we'll talk a bit about opportunities and challenges for the future, all in 30 minutes. So in any case, uh, uh, first of all, the distinctive features of intramural NIH. And these are things that I usually talk uh, to the uh, site visitors about when we uh, begin our orientation uh, for site visits. And so those of you who have been to site visits perhaps will recognize at least this slide. So the first thing is that uh, in the intramural NIH, there is really an institutional commitment to researchers over projects. And so it's a little bit more like the Hughes Institute uh, than uh, a grant-driven uh, kind of uh, uh, environment. Uh, there is a quadrennial, heavily re retrospective uh, review process, and it varies from institute to institute as to what percentage of the review actually is retrospective versus prospective. In NHGRI, it's about 50-50 in terms of retrospective and prospective. In some of the other institutes, it's as much as 80-20 uh, retrospective uh, prospective. Uh, thirdly, uh, because of the fact that we have this commitment to researchers and a quadrennial uh, retrospective type of review, uh, the intramural program perhaps lends itself to long-term studies that require uh, stable funding and is a place where, at least to some extent, uh, one can conduct high-risk, high-reward projects that would be difficult to do uh, with typical uh, R01 uh, funding mechanisms. There are also specialized resources in the intramural program, and certainly the one that probably stands out the most is the clinical center of the NIH, and we'll turn to that uh, in just a moment. Uh, next, uh, there's a critical mass uh, in certain areas, and, and particularly uh, in genomic medicine, I would say, uh, in immunology, in structural biology, and in vaccine research. Uh, there is uh, very much a critical mass uh, in terms of uh, really uh, uh, excellence uh, in the intramural program. One of the things that the intramural program was specifically designed to do was to be able to turn on a dime that when there are public health uh, emergencies like the Ebola uh, emer emergency or back in the 1980s, the HIV 
uh, crisis, but substantial resources can be marshaled uh, to study those uh, areas and to make progress uh, relatively rapidly. Uh, next, uh, it is the uh, intellectual home for institute directors and extramural program staff, and we're, we really want to have uh, a vibrant environment where uh, these people can uh, have uh, uh, an interest in science. And then finally, uh, it is, of course, close to the seat of government, and it's not unusual uh, for senators or Congress people uh, to come to the intramural program to see what's going on, and we certainly want to have uh, the best possible uh, environment to show off uh, to them. This is just a, uh, a picture of the clinical center uh, of the NIH. It's a 234-bed hospital uh, where patients can be admitted uh, at no cost to themselves or to the investigator who is admitting them. And because of that, it really does open the possibility for people to do uh, uh, research studies that are driven by the science. Of course, all of the, uh, the patients have to come in on a uh, IRB-approved protocol, but still, it really does open the doors then for uh, a lot of intellectual freedom uh, with regard to the, uh, uh, the clinical research. Within the NHGRI intramural program, just a brief uh, overview of, of what it's all about. Uh, we have right now 22 tenured investigators and three tenure track investigators. And actually, we are in the process of converting one of our physician scientist development program uh, uh, members uh, into a tenure track position. And so this will soon become four tenure track uh, investigators. Three of our uh, tenured investigators are members of the National Academy of Medicine, and two are members of the National Academy of Sciences. We have 14 associate investigators. The associate investigators are like the research track uh, at uh, academic medical centers. Uh, we have nine adjunct investigators whose primary uh, appointment is with other institutes, but who collaborate with uh, the NHGRI. As I mentioned, uh, we have one member of the Physician Scientist Development Program, which is a, a program that Les Biesecker developed a number of years ago <coughs> to help individuals who have finished their clinical training uh, get sufficient research background that they can compete for tenure track uh, positions. Uh, we currently have 513 uh, personnel uh, within the intramural program. This doesn't include contractors. With contractors, it's a little above uh, 600. And after a reorganization that we did in uh, late uh, 2013, we now have uh, nine branches, and I will illustrate the uh, organizational structure in the next slide. Uh, we have eight cores, uh, the NIH intramural sequencing program, CIDR, which uh, Eric alluded to in his talk, and then the Undiagnosed Diseases Program. Uh, the fiscal year 2016 budget for the intramural program is $105.4 million, so it represents about 20 percent of the overall funding uh, of the NHGRI. Uh, and it's a far-flung uh, operation uh, with seven buildings on campus and two off campus, and that's just in part uh, a product of the fact that the NHGRI intramural program is young relative to some of the other uh, intramural programs, and so we've basically gotten space wherever we can uh, as we've grown. This is just the organizational chart uh, of the intramural program. Uh, a number of individuals are relatively new uh, in their positions. So Paul Liu, uh, our deputy scientific director, uh, who Eric uh, alluded to at the end of his talk, uh, uh, is uh, the uh, is relatively new uh, deputy scientific director. He replaced uh, Andy Baxavanis, who took a uh, NIH-wide uh, intramural uh, role with regard to computational biology. Paul uh, replaced him. We have three uh, new branch chiefs uh, who were appointed at the time of the reorganization, uh, and they uh, are uh, Charles Rotimi, uh, Julie Segre, uh, and Pam Schwartzberg, uh, and then Laura Cayley is uh, a relatively <coughs> new acting chief of the so Social and Behavioral Research 
Uh, the intramural program of the uh, NHGRI does tend to focus uh, more uh, on the uh, dimensions of the uh, uh, density plot uh, from the uh, iconic uh, 2011 uh, figure uh, in nature uh, in basically uh, understanding the biology of disease and uh, under advancing uh, the uh, science of medicine are the two areas that really are the major focus of the intramural program, and that's at least in part uh, due the, to the accessibility of the clinical center. And so uh, there is more of a clinical uh, bent uh, to what's going on in the NHGRI intramural program than perhaps uh, extramurally, although as Eric has said, uh, certainly the intramural program has sort of blazed the way uh, in terms of this, and the extramural program I think is now uh, very much orienting uh, in this direction. Just uh, highlighting a few of the things uh, that have gone on in the intramural program over uh, the last several years. Uh, one of them that really does um, highlight uh, the ability to focus on a particular disease for a long time and to learn something about it and to make great headway uh, is Les Biesecker's uh, project on Proteus syndrome. And Les actually began studying Proteus syndrome uh, 20 years ago, uh, back in 1996, uh, with uh, a natural history protocol. Uh, that protocol allowed for the delineation of a number of uh, sub-phenotypes. Uh, eventually, uh, with the advent of next-gen sequencing, uh, Les was able to demonstrate that, in fact, uh, Proteus syndrome is caused by activating mutations, mosaic activating mutations in AKT1. Uh, and uh, at this point, uh, Les actually has uh, begun uh, a targeted uh, treatment protocol uh, for Proteus syndrome. So this is really an example of where, over the course of a 20-year period of time, with uh, persistence and intensive study, uh, we've gone from the delineation of the clinical phenotypes on to uh, a treatment protocol. Another example uh, of this sort of thing uh, is uh, the work of Chuck Venditti, uh, who was a member of, uh, initially, a member of the Physician Scientist Development Program. And during his tenure track, uh, he became one of the world's uh, experts in organic aciduria's, and in fact, uh, accrued over the course of time a very large cohort of patients with different uh, organic acidurias. And this is just uh, uh, an excerpt uh, from a paper that he published in Nature Genetics uh, back in 2011 uh, describing a new gene that's the cause of combined malonic and methylmalonic uh, aciduria. Moving on to the social and behavioral research uh, branch, uh, Philip Shaw, who is one of our uh, new tenure track or relatively new tenure track investigators, has uh, actually at this point accrued the largest uh, cohort of patients with ADHD uh, who have undergone serial MRI scans. And so basically uh, what Philip is trying to do is to define a biologic phenotype rather than just uh, going based on uh, clinical phenotyping of patients. And so uh, this actually illustrates uh, some of the uh, data that uh, Philip has, has garnered, uh, basically showing uh, the connectome uh, uh, tracks uh, within the brain uh, that turn out to be highly heritable uh, and, in fact, that uh, uh, correlate uh, with ADHD. And so just as uh, we've learned recently that schizophrenia is a disorder in which there's excessive pruning of certain synapses. Uh, in the case of ADHD, there's a deficiency in terms of pruning of certain synapses uh, over the course of uh, adolescent development. Um, another example of a focused uh, uh, examination of a particular uh, uh, group of patients that has led to great insight is Ellen Zydransky's work uh, on uh, Gaucher disease and the observation uh, that, in fact, uh, mutations in gluco glucose cerebrosidase uh, predispose to Parkinson's uh, disease. And uh, she has gone on, uh, as illustrated in this slide, uh, to make iPS cell lines uh, from patients uh, that have 
uh, glucose cerebrosidase mutations and has developed Parkinson's disease uh, and has uh, screened uh, these cell lines uh, with a compound from the uh, uh, NCAS, uh, from the uh, uh, National Center for Uh, but anyway, the NCGC uh, uh, and uh, uh, chemical genomics uh, and uh, has identified a compound that actually has an effect in terms of uh, the um, uh, trafficking of glucose cerebrosidase in the cells and thereby the uh, accumulation of alpha synuclein. Uh, and so this uh, actually does uh, represent then uh, a um, uh, possible uh, therapeutic modality uh, for, uh, for Parkinson's disease uh, going forward. Uh, this slide illustrates yet another interaction between one of our uh, intramural investigators, this uh, being Joan Bailey Wilson, uh, with a very uh, productive collaboration with Steve Wang, who's a gastroenterologist in NIDDK, uh, identifying a gene that uh, uh, predisposes to uh, small intestinal carcinoid uh, tumors. And then uh, on this slide uh, from um, Cam Schwartzberg's group, uh, the identification of germline mutations in TIC kinase uh, catalytic subunit as leading to an immunodeficiency disease. And basically what happens in this condition uh, is that because uh, of activating mutations in TIC kinase, uh, there's actually an exhaustion of certain subsets of T cells uh, leading to uh, uh, an immunodeficiency. Uh, from my own group, um, uh, we uh, described a condition a couple of years ago uh, that we call DADA2, uh, which is deficiency of adenosine deaminase type 2. Now, some of you may know uh, adenosine deaminase type 1 or just ADA. Uh, is the enzyme that's deficient in many patients with severe combined immunodeficiency disease. In this particular case, the phenotype uh, was one in which patients were referred to us with recurrent fevers and strokes. Uh, and these patients, uh, in fact, had multiple uh, lacunar strokes in the uh, 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 deep uh, nuclei of the brain, as, as uh, illustrated here on these MRIs. Uh, these patients have mutations in adenosine deaminase 2. Uh, this figure here actually shows uh, polyarteritis nodosa, uh, which is another phenotype that can be associated uh, with this condition. And in any case, uh, having this cohort of patients and having uh, some detailed phenotypic uh, information about these patients and linking up with another group in Israel uh, that had a cohort of patients with uh, the PAN uh, form of uh, DADA2 uh, allowed us to at least start thinking about treatments for this condition. And so uh, in the cohort of patients that we have, um, they had cumulative, cumulatively 44 strokes over 1,064 uh, patient months, so roughly one stroke every two years. Uh, because of the fact that we saw uh, tumor necrosis factor in the perivascular areas in these patients. We uh, started on our protocol uh, TNF inhibition in these patients. And so in 323 uh, follow-up patient months, same patients, 12 patients, zero strokes. And so really this is an example of how uh, uh, the intensive study in a clinical center does allow one to uh, uh, learn uh, something that, that can do some good for and then finally, uh, another paper that we had uh, just come out last week in the New England Journal uh, deals with vibratory urticaria. So vibratory urticaria is a condition in which if you take someone's arm uh, and put it on a laboratory vortex, uh, they will actually develop a hive uh, on their arm. And this is illustrated here in a control individual before challenge and after challenge, no difference uh, in the appearance of the arm. Uh, whereas in this patient, you can see the development of a hive uh, induced uh, by uh, stimulation. And this is caused actually by mutations in uh, a gene, ADGRE2, uh, which is a novel, encodes a novel protein, which is a, actually a mechanosensor uh, 
uh, on the surfaces of mast cells uh, that actually can uh, uh, detect um, uh, uh, vibration. And these particular patients happen to have uh, a mutation that uh, leads to increased sensitivity uh, to vibratory stimuli. So in any case, uh, another uh, interesting uh, uh, development. Uh, this slide simply illustrates some of the work that Francis Collins' group is doing uh, with regard to the epigenome uh, in type 2 diabetes. Uh, and uh, one of the things that they have found uh, is that in islet cells, uh, actually, there is a chromatin state that is specific for the islet cell uh, and uh, a stretch enhancer, as Francis' group uh, calls it, uh, which actually turns on uh, the glucokinase uh, gene uh, in islet, islet cells. Another uh, interesting uh, uh, development, uh, which is coming out, I believe, this week, uh, is uh, a paper uh, from uh, Laura Elnitsky's group, uh, which shows that there's hypermethylation of the GNF154 promoter in solid tumors, and that this uh, actually uh, could be the basis for a blood test uh, for certain uh, solid tumors. Uh, here, uh, turning to uh, the canine side of things, uh, is actually uh, something from Elaine Ostrander's group uh, that uh, uh, deals with a venereal tumor uh, that can be transmitted uh, between dogs. Uh, and basically, this uh, image just shows the chromosomal translocations that occur uh, in these venereal tumors. And uh, uh, basically, in these tumors, there are a number of rearrangements, a number of mutations that actually are in immune-related genes uh, that render these tumors uh, uh, undetectable or at least very difficult uh, to detect uh, by the immune system. Work from uh, Bill Pavin's group uh, looking at SOX10 uh, actually shows uh, a difference in terms of the activation mode of SOX10 uh, uh, in uh, pigmentation where it is activated versus uh, uh, in um, uh, melanoma where it is inactivated. Uh, and then work from my own group uh, looking at pyrin, uh, the protein that is mutated in familiar Mediterranean fever. This is something that uh, we have uh, under review at Nature, uh, basically uh, showing that uh, in fact, pyrin uh, is controlled uh, by rho GTP ACEs. And in fact, uh, there are certain bacterial toxins which poison uh, rho A, one of the rho GTP ACEs, uh, and that this is what actually is uh, being sensed and what um, uh, regulates the pyrin inflammasome. Uh, this mechanism, which is known as the guard mechanism for uh, regulating is something that, at least up until now, has only been seen uh, in plants. Uh, and so it's at least uh, the first example of where this guard mechanism uh, may be uh, involved in humans. So anyway, then turning to uh, the impact of the NHGRI IRP on the NIH campus and beyond, just a few things that I will uh, briefly mention. Uh, first of all, uh, many of our investigators actually <coughs> Uh, are experts in particular diseases that then uh, 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 can be uh, referral centers for uh, investigators other places. This is just an illustration of Max Munke's work uh, with Munke syndrome, uh, which is a form of craniosynostosis, uh, and essentially just uh, illustrating a, a recent review of his group on this topic, but there are many uh, intramural investigators that essentially uh, serve as, as uh, experts uh, in these uh, diseases. Next-gen sequencing at NISC is another area where uh, the uh, NHGRI intramural program has really uh, had a major impact, and uh, this uh, uh, graph uh, simply shows that over the course of the last five years, uh, that the number of samples that NISC has uh, sequenced has uh, uh, gone up by an order of magnitude, and that if one looks at the samples, uh, at least uh, uh, the investigators who have submitted the samples, because this is something that is available to 
uh, investigators in other institutes uh, that in fact the majority of samples uh, are from other institutes. And so this really does uh, subserve a very important uh, function uh, at the NIH. Uh, recently, uh, Les Biesecker uh, uh, and Jim Mulliken uh, spearheaded uh, the Clinical Central Center uh, Genomics Opportunity uh, Project, uh, which is a project that allows investigators from other institutes uh, to uh, do whole exome sequencing for medically uh, important uh, diseases. And so this is uh, another area where NHGRI is, is taking the lead uh, in terms of uh, 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 genomic uh, analysis uh, in the intramural program. Uh, of course, uh, Les Biesecker's ClinSeq uh, program uh, is another example of this uh, in which uh, essentially uh, uh, the uh, 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 basis of, of uh, uh, genomic medicine has really been uh, uh, defined uh, and uh, just some examples here of uh, some of the uh, papers that have uh, resulted uh, from that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, as uh, Eric alluded to, uh, the Undiagnosed Diseases uh, Network, which is really an outgrowth of the Undiagnosed Diseases Program, uh, which Bill Gall uh, established in the, in the intramural program back in 2008, uh, which has now really grown into something that uh, has uh, had uh, major impact uh, across uh, the uh, research community. Um, and uh, in connection with that, our social and behavioral research branch uh, has really uh, uh, spearheaded uh, the analysis of a lot of the uh, uh, secondary findings uh, in the uh, in the uh, Undiagnosed Disease Program and in the ClinSeq uh, Program, uh, and so that uh, also has uh, had, I think, a major impact. Uh, software has been uh, made available through a number of our uh, intramural investigators, and just for lack of time, I won't go uh, through uh, all of those. Uh, we have the Current Topics in Genome Analysis Series, uh, which um, uh, has now gone on for 12 years, and actually uh, Andy Baxavanis and Eric have uh, had a leadership role in that uh, uh, course, and you can see here that uh, uh, attesting to its uh, uh, impact, uh, there have been uh, 740,000 YouTube views of uh, hosted lectures uh, to date. Uh, then moving to other areas of impact, I'll just mention Charles Rotini's role in terms of uh, uh, the H3 Africa work, uh, Julie Segre's work uh, defining the, uh, uh, the uh, landscape of uh, bacterial and fungal uh, uh, colonization of humans, her pioneering work with regard to tracing uh, uh, hospital-acquired uh, antibiotic organisms, and then a recent paper uh, from, or set of papers from Sean Burgess uh, basically uh, laying out uh, a strain, NIH1, uh, for zebrafish CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, mutagenesis um, uh, in a, a targeted mutagenesis of 162 different loci, uh, and then finally uh, the um, compilation of all of the CRISPR-Cas uh, uh, mutations that uh, are at least extant in the literature as of the, uh, uh, the last, uh, at the end of last year. Uh, science in the uh, intramural program is evaluated by a board of scientific counselors, a set of outside experts. John Atkinson is currently the chair of our board of scientific counselors. Uh, the three uh, members who are highlighted in yellow are our newest members, Lucille Adams Campbell, an epidemiologist from Georgetown, Jeff Murray, many of you know from the Gates Foundation, uh, and Tim Town, 
Um, the investigators in the program are rated on a uh, scale of outstanding, excellent, and very good. Uh, and at least uh, over the last four years, 27 have been rated as fully outstanding uh, out of 39, uh, which is uh, approximately 70 percent. Um, just to turn to the budget, and I see that we're nearly out of time. Um, the um, budget this year, as I mentioned, is $105 million a year. It has been relatively flat uh, over the last uh, several years, and so when I took the position as uh, scientific director in 2010, it was $104 million. Uh, it did go down, and it's now uh, beginning to go up. Uh, on average, our investigators have uh, had a 16 percent reduction in overall budget uh, over this period of time. Uh, we have recruited two new tenure-track investigators that I will just mention. Uh, Adam Philippi, a uh, bioinformatician uh, from the National Biodefense Analysis and Countermeasures uh, Center. That's a part of the Department of Homeland Security, and Adam was actually uh, uh, in the part of the Department of Homeland Security that would screen um, uh, the white powder that people would receive in the mail or might receive in the mail, uh, determining whether or not uh, it's some sort of a pathogen. He's an expert in algorithm development and single molecule sequencing. And then finally, uh, Peter McGuire, who's uh, being promoted from our physician scientist development program uh, to a tenure track position. And this uh, image just shows uh, the metabolomics uh, work that he's doing, basically showing that in a principal component analysis of uh, uh, metabolism, uh, metabolites, that in point of fact, uh, one can separate uh, subsets of, of B lymphocytes. So in terms of challenges for the future, uh, continued faculty recruitment is one of them. Uh, expanded engagement with other institutes, uh, a seamless integration of bioinformatics with bench science, science and we're right now uh, renovating space in one of our buildings to bring together uh, uh, Adam Philippi uh, with two other individuals, uh, uh, Julie Segre uh, uh, and Laura Elnitsky, uh, toward the molecular taxonomy of human disease so that basically we're looking uh, to do more of what I've described up until now, uh, that is to say, uh, identify monogenic disease genes. And then the 10,000 10, exome re recall cohort is basically uh, developing a cohort of, of uh, patients at the clinical center uh, who will be fully uh, genotyped and where we can call them back if they have interesting genotypes uh, for deep genotyping. So I think with that, I'll call it to a close. I did actually make it uh, in the allotted time. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer. Thanks a lot. You can certainly take some time for questions or comments. Val? I guess I had a couple of budgetary questions. So in the $105 million, I think you mentioned that uh, investigators could have patients evaluated yes. uh, internally for no cost. So the cost of that actually, um, and I didn't have time to go through that aspect of the budget, but uh, we are actually charged, each of the institutes that uh, sees patients from the clinical center, uh, we are charged a so-called school tax. Uh, which is 14 percent of our intramural budget. So that since we have a approximately $100 million budget, uh, that means that uh, in essence uh, we spend about $14 million a year. So it's, it's quote unquote uh, at no cost, but we're paying $14 million a year uh, to have that privilege of being able to do that. Yeah, so the, uh, that $14 million is part of the 105 or in That's addition? Correct. And so that you pay that uh, based on your budget, not based on the number of patients that you evaluate. That's right. And so we. And do you have any idea of whether you're losing money or you're making money in the 
based on the number of patients that you're seeing? Yeah, well, right now NHGRI is a little bit on the side of losing money, so that we actually uh, if we could, it would be good if we could see more patients at the clinical center in order to get our money back. Uh, what about with the NISC? What's the finances of that? So the NISC, it's also part of um, the $105 million, and we spend approximately uh, $7 million a year on uh, NIST, and uh, that uh, basically allows us to uh, maintain the sequencers, maintain at least some bioinformatic uh, analysis of, of the sequence. We do have a program within the uh, intramural NHGRI where people can uh, apply for competitive grants, uh, basically, or competitive uh, uh, funding of sequencing where uh, people can either have large flagship projects or smaller uh, pilot projects uh, that uh, if they compete well uh, in this process, uh, they would be able to do. Uh, and then uh, as a part of this clinical center genomics opportunity, uh, we do provide uh, funding for a thousand exome cores uh, for other investigators. That's actually a, uh, a joint project with uh, Michael Gottesman's office, the deputy director for intramural research, uh, who uh, basically is paying <coughs> half of the cost of that. Yeah, so you might not be responsible for the answer of this, but so that seven million is also part of the hundred and five. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. And you know how competitive you are with the commercial sequencing price-wise. Uh, well, uh, yes, we we are relatively uh, competitive right now um, to uh, uh, charge if if we charge intramural investigators with NHGRI, uh, the cost is about $500 an exome. Very good, thanks. The, the other thing, Val, the other subtle thing uh, worth pointing out about that is um, since a lot of what they do is, uh, is fee for service, I mean, and so people will vote for their feet. Right. Um, and some people do go elsewhere, but the big advantage of, of of, of having it done by them is the there's uh, at least some amount of analysis that comes for free uh, by colleagues like you know Jim Mulliken and others and Gary Buffard others in that group and so the the value added is is the is the analysis by other members of faculty. Thanks. Yeah. So first, thank you for the overview. Could you say something about the ten thousand? individual recall cohort. I was not aware of that activity, how you're doing the recruitment, what the goal is, and well, in, can you mention also the diversity within that group? Yeah. So right now it's it's just in its early stages. Oh, sorry. Uh, right now it's it's uh, in its early stages. It's sort of ClinSeq on steroids, you could say. So ClinSeq is certainly uh, at least the, uh, the core of that. Uh, but uh, Patients from other uh, institutes are being uh, incorporated into this, and um, it probably will be something that will take uh, a year or two to accrue all of the patients uh, for this. And the idea is that if we have a cohort of individuals where we have deep uh, genomic information, then we can, uh, if there are investigators at the NIH or elsewhere, uh, who are interested in uh, the phenotype that would be associated with a given uh, genotype, uh, that then uh, we could call them back to the clinical center for deep uh, phenotyping at the clinical center. Anything about the ethnic diversity in the group? And, and you, you answered part of my question. So these are patients ascertained through a condition from another investigator. That's and correct. And somehow That's you correct. enroll them in this. So right now, uh, at least uh, uh, in ClinSeq, uh, there are a number of patients who are African American. Uh, Less uh, has been uh, specifically uh, trying to expand uh, the diversity of, of the ClinSeq cohort on, uh, because of that. Uh, but it's a work in progress in terms of that. I just want to follow up on that, that comment, because when you said ClinSeq on steroids, because 
couldn't speak to volunteers, right? I mean, whereas the clinic, whereas the clinical center, and I just concurred with my colleague. So it's probably different. T totally, yeah. But but that but it would seem to be very very different set of parameters that you're for you know characterizing the population. And in fact, maybe, I mean, the people who come there are more. Um, uh, selected for rare conditions, but they won't have the same selection bias that you'd have from a volunteer cohort. That's right? true. And so one of the things that is, is at least um, uh, in the works, although it has not been uh, formalized yet, is that uh, um, uh, Les and Richard Siegel uh, in NIAMS are establishing a, a relationship with Inova Fairfax. Uh, and they actually have been doing uh, Okay, that's a, okay, that is a hospital in Northern Virginia, uh, and uh, uh, they actually have been doing whole genome sequencing on uh, uh, just uh, individuals uh, who come through that hospital. In a lot of cases, it's through the uh, uh, obstetrics department, and so it's just normal uh, deliveries. Uh, and um, they have actually 8,000 uh, individuals who have had uh, whole genome sequencing, uh, where in fact that might uh, shift the distribution uh, more towards the, uh, uh, the type of individual that you're talking about of, of people that are just uh, uh, from the population. Sam? So, so thank, thank you for that. Summary. I, I, I just have a I have a two questions, and it just shows my naivete about the about the intramural program. Wh what does tenure mean? I know what tenure means at my place, but I'm not sure what tenure means here. That was one question, and then the other was the so the introduction is sort of high risk, high reward, uh, a long term investment in programs that couldn't be done elsewhere. And you showed some beautiful examples of science. I'm not sure. I agree that a lot of it couldn't be done elsewhere. And so can you talk a little bit about the things that the intramural program does that, I, you know, that are examples of things that, that really are, you know, such long-term high-risk, high-reward investment or uh, the turning on a dime, the, you know, is there anything in going on in, in not Ebola's last year, I believe, yes. Zika, for example, that, that you know, if you tried to do it through ordinary grant mechanisms, it would take a year and a half before anybody got a dollar to start to work on it. So could you talk a little bit about those yeah. things? So with regard to tenure, first of all, uh, so tenure is uh, something that, uh, as opposed to uh, in most academic institutions in which one can be tenured, and if you don't have grant funding, uh, then it's going to be very difficult to maintain uh, your your research program. In fact, in the intramural program, tenure uh, does uh, involve a long-term commitment uh, to an individual as long as they uh, maintain their productivity as judged by reviews by the Board of Scientific Counselors. And that's, that's really uh, the crux of the matter. The key is that people have to maintain their productivity in order to uh, maintain their funding. But uh, if one does uh, maintain that, then it is a, a commitment in a way that one doesn't usually see uh, in a, a university or academic health center. Uh, so that's uh, with regard to tenure. Now, with regard to uh, programs that people do in the intramural program that uh, are high risk, high reward, or things that uh, can't be done uh, other places, uh, well, I suppose that, you know, one can say that nearly anything, uh, if one uh, focuses enough on it that one could do it in another place. I do think that uh, the examples of, of some of the cohorts of patients with rare diseases uh, where, in point of fact, it would be very difficult to maintain those cohorts over a long period of time, uh, as I uh, uh, mentioned with Les Biesecker's work, uh, for example, on Proteus syndrome, is something that, sure, one could do it somewhere else. It's not as if it couldn't be done anywhere else. Uh, but certainly those kinds of projects are projects that uh, uh, would be hard to maintain anyway uh, in, another, uh, in another setting. 
As far as turning on a dime is concerned, certainly right now there is um, uh, an initiative in NIAID uh, to start uh, tackling Zika uh, virus. And so uh, there are such things as that. Certainly uh, uh, last year, Ebola, as, as you may know, uh, there were Ebola patients that were uh, at the uh, clinical center of, of the NIH. And uh, certainly uh, in the 1980s, uh, with the beginning of the HIV uh, epidemic, uh, there was a lot that was being done uh, in the intramural program. But, you know, by and large, I would have to say that the most important thing uh, with regard to intramural science is excellence. And that certainly is, is the thing that uh, in our uh, review process is really, really critical. Anything else? Okay. So thank you, Dan. You're great. And Rudy, you're going to instruct us. All right. So uh, why don't we try to be back by uh, 1.15 to resume the open session. There's a cafeteria one floor up that I recommend for lunch. You can bring your food back down here if you like, if there aren't tables available. You can also go upstairs on the fourth floor and visit with staff. Um, you can leave your computers. If someone will be in the room all the time, I would advise you to take purses and wallets. Okay. okay. We'll see you at 115.